Hallelujah. Good morning, everyone. You're welcome to the service today. This is the King's Court Zion Ascent service. We started off a new series in the book of Acts, more like a school of ministry thing, if you will. And we, we're coming under the uh, umbrella of Kingdom Ministers United. Kingdom Ministers United is also a ministry that the Lord helped us to uh, start up an outreach ministry, if you will, uh, more dedicated to developing ministers, equipping ministers, and actually networking with ministers as well, because we believe in the fact that, you know, ministers need to come together so as to maximize our potentials for the advancement of God's kingdom. So we titled the book of Acts, we're, we're looking at maybe not the entire book, but highlights in the book of Acts, and we started on Wednesday. So today we're going to go with session two, but let's start off with prayers. Father, we give you praise. Thank you for the privilege to access your presence. Thank you for the Holy Spirit whom you have given us to be with us, to be in us forever. He is the teacher. He's our guide. He's our helper. So we cannot say that we do not have help. We cannot say that we do not have a teacher. And because we have you, Holy Spirit, then we can know the word of God. We can receive clarity in the word of God. You even, Jesus even said, you will show us things to come. You will take from the Lord Jesus and reveal to us. So we're exploring all these dimensions of your grace, of your person, of who you are, and the wonderful gifts that you are to us who believe in the Lord Jesus. So as we move on today in today's message, looking at the book of Acts, Holy Spirit, teach us, guide us into all truth, glorify Jesus, and we say amen, amen. All right, so book of Acts, and this is session two. So Okay. All right. So I'm just going to go through, we did this on Wednesday, but just for those who are joining us for the first time, a little bit about the Kingdom Ministers United. Kingdom Ministers United is a network of Christian ministers with a purpose to highlight and reinforce the message of God's kingdom, emphasizing the Lord Jesus Christ as king of this kingdom, as well as the order of his kingdom. There's an order to God's kingdom, but that's not what we're talking about today. Kingdom Ministries United provides leadership, ministry resource for capacity building, as well as humanitarian assistance to Christian ministers and ministries across the United States, Canada, Europe, and Sub-Saharan Africa. By the way, Kingdom Ministries United is hosting a conference by the end of this month. More information will come on that. About the course, this course, the Book of Acts, records the continued ministry of Jesus Christ through the third person of the Godhead, that is the Holy Spirit. The book also shows the birth of the church that Jesus Christ promised that he would build. And we also see in the book how human or human lives and the world around them, including the events of the world, were shaped and influenced through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Somebody may ask, why are we doing this? Well, because the knowledge of the book is needed to equip us as believers and as ministers, both in principle and from a historical perspective. So we not only have historical knowledge of what really happened, but we also have principles to live by. And we're going to talk more about that as we proceed. A little bit again about the course in terms of the syllabus. The expected outcome is that at the end of this course, students or those who go through it with us will become knowledgeable of the historical facts of the book or the events of the book, become familiar with the fundamental principles of the faith because some of them are found in the book, and then be able to defend the faith better. A lot of times we find believers are shy to defend the faith because they don't have uh, uh, you know, confidence in the principles of the faith. But you're going to find some in the book of Acts, and when you know them, then you are able to defend them better. And then, of course, the book is intended to equip us to be able to minister through the power of the Holy Spirit, not just for head knowledge, but so that we can actually become those 
who have not only received the Holy Spirit, but do minister in the power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen to that. So we did say that the course will be divided into three parts. The first part, which we are on right now, is going to be looking into what I consider fundamental, foundational background information. I, I call it background information because it is not readily seen. You, you won't find these things in the book of Acts, but they are pertinent. They are important. They are relevant to the book and what the book is trying to accomplish. So we go into the background information of what's going on in the background behind the scenes to give us a better knowledge of what is truly portrayed or you know, presented in the book itself. Second part, we'll go, be going into some recorded events and how they follow the trajectory of prophetic utterances that were made concerning the book. And of course, in the third part, we'll be talking about some highlights in the book. So we're already in part one and we started on Wednesday. On Wednesday, we talked about Book of Acts, Prophecy Fulfilled. It should actually be a question. So we went into prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ concerning the Holy Spirit, what he would do when he does come and what the disciples would expect of the Holy Spirit, who he is, called him Spirit of Truth, and so on and so forth. And we saw the direction of that prophetic insight, beginning from introducing him as a distant reality up until talking about him as a present reality. And that's beautiful. It's so beautiful to know that, you know, the Lord Jesus spoke about these things even way before they happened. So we are in part one and we've dealt with that. So today we're in session two, and that is the book of Acts. Who's Acts? Book of Acts, who's Acts? All right, let's go right in. So today we're going to be looking, we're going to try to cover this four subheadings or subtitles, if you will. The authorship of the book, the author's preamble, what I call caveat lector. You already know caveat emptor, which is bias beware, you know, beware of what you're purchasing. Well, caveat lector is readers beware. Beware what you read or as you read, observe and make sure you know what you're reading. And then we're going to talk about a powerful treatise for the Christian faith. And when we get there, I really want us to pay attention because you'll be, as you understand that, you'll be building your faith and understanding the precepts or the principles of the Christian faith to which we belong. So let's start off with authorship of the book. So in talking about the authorship of the book, the book of Acts is generally accepted to have been written by one called Luke, a second generation disciple of Jesus Christ. What do you mean second generation? He was not one of the first disciples of Jesus. He was somebody who came on later, <clears throat> maybe mentored by one of the first generation uh, disciples of Jesus. It is also believed that he is the writer of the gospel according to Luke, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. We find that the book of Acts appears to be a sequel or a continuation, part two, if you will, to the gospel according to Luke. We're going to see how they both connect and why we believe so. But before you go ahead to begin to establish authorship, well, there are certain things we want to take note of. It's not enough to just make claims or statements and assumptions about things of critical significance. And I, I point this out because a lot of times uh, people of faith are, are often considered by people on the outside to be gullible, to be ridiculous, to not be detailed, to not be those who are proof producers we just believe. But the truth of the matter is that there's a science to our belief. <laughs> there's a science to the faith. The thing is, I guess that we have not been taught or raised in that way to be defenders of the faith. We do have some apologists who defend the faith and they have their tools that they actually use to do that. So it's not just enough to go ahead and just claim, make a claim and then expect everyone to believe that or everyone to accept that there are actually ways to prove this thing. So is there a way to separate mere claims from substantive and authoritative conclusions? Yes, there are. 
for those who have been to Bible school, they already understand what you meant by what you mean by exegesis and hermeneutics. These are, you may call them science, and I do call them science because in reality, science is the study of life. Science is our study, any study that engages life in general. If you're studying life, the, the, you know, the, the, the operative processes of life, how life works, then that's a science. It's not only when you're doing physics, chemistry, biology, and those subjects that are dedicated or well-known as science. But humans, as human life is a science in itself. Music is a science. So if you're studying anything that has to do with life, you are actually in science. May not be, you know, uh, uh, the major sciences could be life sciences, human sciences, you know, society, science of the society and so on and so forth. So if that is the case, then the study of belief systems, the study of religion, the study of, you know, things that pertain to a particular religion is also a science. And so we do have these tools, one, two of which are exegesis and hermeneutics. So what is exegesis? It is the science that deals with the critical, so you see that, the critical interpretation of biblical text so, so as to discover its intended meaning. So exegesis provides the tools for Bible scholars, Bible students, ministers to be able to, you know, critically interpret biblical text so as to deduce or derive its meaning, what it was intended to communicate. And then when you talk about hermeneutics, hermeneutics is the science that deals with the study of the general principle of biblical interpretation. So while one deals with the actual text, the other deals with the entire, you know, general principles of biblical interpretation. And we're going to apply that to our study for today. So one of the principles in hermeneutics is to allow the scriptures or to allow the text of the Bible, biblical text, to explain itself. Uh, there's a popular way people say it. Say, scripture is its own interpreter. People say that. Well, that came from this rule. The Bible is its own interpreter. So in other words, allow the text or the context to explain the text. A lot of times, this is important because a lot of times ministers zone in on a particular phrase, zone in on a particular statement or a particular sentence and run with it. And then, you know, they put a lot of stuff together and run with that. But sometimes when you do a diligent study and go through the context, you may find out that they are applying, either applying a wrong text to what they're trying to say or the text has no relevance to what they are saying at all. Or what they are saying has no relevance to the biblical text. It goes both ways. So when it says the scripture interprets scripture or for you as a student to allow the biblical text to explain itself, it requires that you depend on internal sources. Before you begin to look for external sources, my bishop said, my apostle said, or so and so person said, well, what does the text itself say? Do a little study of your own from the text and within the context, it's not just, the, so the text is the, the particular verse or line you're looking at, but context is the whole story, the whole narrative. What's going on? Who's saying it? What brought this about? Why are they saying it? Where are they saying it from? What is its relevance? What is it saying that it is saying? Because if a text is saying, this is what I'm saying, and you take it and say it's saying something else, then you've already violated that text. So let the text explain itself. So if we go by that, then let's go through the text and consider internal source, consider what the text says. So in Acts chapter 1 from verse 1, and we're going to be using King James Version for a particular reason just for this uh, uh, for this portion of the course, actually, the word treatise, we're gonna come back to it. But it says there, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. So if we look at that text following 
the principle we just laid out, we see that the writer is referring to a former or a previous work that he made or that he wrote. So there is a work, whoever wrote this is referring us back to. So we can say, we can see that. But we also see that he specifically addresses a person whose name is spelled out in black and white, the name Theophilus. And then we also see that he states the purpose of his writing, why he's writing. So at least we can deduce those three things just from this verse one in Acts chapter one and verse one. So let's try to proceed. So when we, when, we, when we do that and then try to compare the opening statement, the opening statement of Acts that we just read, compare it to the opening statement of Luke, we're gonna see that something connects both books. So let's do that. In, in Luke chapter one and verse three, again from King James Version, it says, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto you in order, most excellent Theophilus. So just considering that text, what the text itself is saying, going by that rule in hermeneutics, we see that the writer emphasizes, first and foremost, his credibility. He's trying to let us know that he is one who has understanding of what was going on at the time, and his understanding goes back to the beginning. So this person was either there or had firsthand information, or if you will, maybe secondhand information from those who were there. It's got to be one of the two. Either he was there and was on the side to the side or he saw some, experienced some, witnessed some, and got some from those who were there themselves, who were witnesses themselves. And we're gonna go into details on that. But he also emphasizes his diligence. He says, I'm writing to you in order. So this is not a haphazard work. This is not, you know, cut and paste. <laughs> this is not, you know, patchwork. I am writing an orderly account to you. We're going to get more into that. But he also now specifies the same individual, Theophilus. So he's writing to a specific person. And so we can tell from that that something is going on here between these two texts. We see uniformity and a connection between both books. It appears like the same author is, write, is speaking or writing uh, from both perspectives, from both books. One thing we see is that this, at least the name Theophilus connects both books. So we can conclude the author of both books was Luke because the first book, or the, which we just read last, is Luke in dedication to the one who wrote it. So if Luke wrote Luke, then it is okay to say Luke also wrote Acts because there's that connection right there. But we can also tell that he was a credible source. We can conclude that he was a credible source. I mean, he, he speaks about it himself. And we can also tell that he put in a lot of work into both writings. And then we can also tell that he is handing down vital information to a protege. So he's not just writing for himself, he's writing to somebody who he hopes will carry it on to the next generation, or we carry it on at least. At least we can deduce those from those texts. And that is how to let text explain itself. So with that, let's go to the author's preamble. So we've established from those later, and we're going to see details later more anyway, but we can establish that the author of the book of Acts is Luke, who also wrote the book of Luke. So let's talk about the author's preamble. Now we want to go into the whole thing as far as the preamble is concerned. In talking about preamble, any meaningful study of any material whatsoever will involve deciphering the purpose of the material. If you want to study a material, if you want to you know, talk about or review any material, I think one of the things you want to consider is the purpose. What is the purpose? What is it trying to accomplish? And the same applies even to biblical text or the books. So knowing the purpose of a work helps put the readers 
in the best frame of mind to appreciate the effort. I remember years back when we used to watch, you know, uh, imported material from Western world where I used to live, we didn't quite understand what was going on. There was the, the language barrier, first and foremost, uh, not that we didn't speak English, I mean, it's just the, 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 the phonetics, the accent and all of that, the style and all of that. And then of course we, we, weren't, we weren't privy to the history, the background, why is this happening? What is making this, you know, why is the producer producing this movie? We, we didn't have the background knowledge. So we couldn't appreciate to the degree that we should materials that came from outside of our country. At best, we enjoyed the action part. <laughs> the action part, anybody could relate to it. <laughs> I remember those days when we would see movies from Asia, especially China and Japan and all that, you know, two people coming, one from the East, the other coming from the West, and without any, you know, introduction or preamble, they would just start fighting. And anybody would be like, what kind of movie is this? Somebody is coming from here, the other person is coming from there, and they're just fighting. We didn't know why. But now with better understanding, I can tell you why that was. Because there was an animosity between the Chinese and the Japanese. The Japanese at the time were trying to dominate the Chinese. And so taking, I mean, it was an imposition. So whenever a Japanese met a Chinese, it is fight to the finish. <laughs> so with that, you can understand, oh, that's why they were doing that. That's why that would happen because they already know, I can tell you a Japanese from your dressing, I can tell you a Chinese from the way you're dressed. So it's like, you know, a fight is gonna happen. So, but in order to understand the material, you have to understand the purpose behind it. All right, so again, going by the principle of hermeneutics, which again says to allow the text explain itself, we will depend on internal source to deduce the purpose of the writing. Some people take from external sources, but we want to stay with internal sources. We think that is most credible. And of course, we can refer to external sources if they you know, apply to what we first deduce from internal sources. Now, bear in mind, both books were by the same author. And so if that is the case, we already said the book of Acts is a sequel or a continuation of the book of Luke. That also means we'll, we're going to be going back and forth, both books. So again, now let's go back to the opening statement of the book of Acts and see certain interesting things revealed through choice of words, words that were the author carefully chose. If you were writing a book, I think you want to stay with certain words that convey the meaning, convey your purpose, convey your state of mind, because that's what you're trying to communicate. So those words we find here will also communicate the state of mind of the author. So again, Acts chapter one, now we're gonna go from verse one to three, again, King James. He said, the former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Verse three says, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. These are choice words. The guy is very careful. The author is careful. The writer is careful to let us know what's going on. He describes the book as a treatise you will have to find out what is a treatise. Why does it define it as a treatise? Not a comedy, not drama, not, uh, you know, folklore, not uh, poet or poetry, but a treatise. So you want to categorize it as that. But in order to do that better, you want to know what a treatise is. So we're going to look at that. But then it talks about that the Lord Jesus showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. For you to declare that something is infallible proofs, oh, you got to be able to produce it. <laughs> you got to let us know what you're talking about. So this man is saying, I'm not just writing fables. I'm not just writing hearsay. 
I'm telling you what has been proven and found to be infallible. But then he's also careful to let us know what, and this is important to us as believers and as ministers. The author, the writer wants us to know what the reason Jesus talked about. And that's important. The reason Jesus, because he's speaking about him showing himself alive to his disciples, you know, by many infallible proofs. But again, it seemed like whatever Jesus was saying stood out. And it says it's about what? Things pertaining to the kingdom of God. I think that if a man died and rose again, first of all, died for a cause that he believed and stood for, and then rose again by, by a miraculous intervention, and then begins to, you know, talk about a particular subject, I think you want to pay attention. I think that's uppermost on his mind. I mean, he, this is him. He's died and he's risen. And what is he talking about when he rose? Things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So again, for those who, do, who are not in kingdom minded, you know, that's something to consider. So we now know from reading that text, the book is a treatise, all right? The author is authoritative regarding the Lord's resurrection. Makes no, you know, Apologies for that. It says that he gave infallible proofs. But we also see that the author lays the foundation for what he will be focusing on, which is what Jesus was saying, or I should say the resurrected Jesus was saying, and that's what? Things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So let's dive in. What is a treatise? The Merriam-Webster Dictionary tells us that Treatise is a systematic exposition or an argument in writing which includes a methodical discussion of the facts and principles involved in the writing or in the exposition, as well as the conclusions reached based on all of that. Now, it's important to remember we didn't write this dictionary. This is Merriam-Webster's dictionary, right? And scholars acknowledge the Merriam-Webster dictionary as a credible one, as one that could be cited, one that could be used in scholarly work, one that could be used in higher schools of learning and higher schools of thought. So we didn't do this. It's not all saying this. The man said it's a treatise, at least the, the, those who translated from the original language to uh, King James uh, uh, version, called it a treatise. Okay, so if they chose the word treatise, then let's get back. You know, we now see what a treatise is. is is an is a systematic exposition. So we can fairly say this author is systematically exposing something. We can also say this author is making an argument in writing. We can also say the author is making a discussion in a methodical fashion. We can also say the author is producing what? Facts and principles regarding the subject matter. And we can also say conclusions were arrived at based on all of that. That is powerful. So we know the book of Luke and the book of Acts are treatises for the Christian faith. How do we know that? The man said it himself. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus. So if you have a former treatise, what do you have? Present treatise, right? <laughs> you see, that easy. So if the other, if the previous book is a former treatise, then this is a present treatise. So the book of Luke and the book of Acts are treatises. And again, what are treatises? A systematic exposition making a case like a legal scholar, like a professional, like a subject matter expert. He's making a methodical discussion. He's deducing facts and principles. So if this author doesn't consider it to be a fact, what? He won't talk about it. He puts it to the side. So we can say that what the author wrote is verifiable. Why am I doing all of this? To let you know, child of God, you can defend the word of God. You can defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can defend your faith. 
it's interesting that people out there can believe whatever they want to believe, say it from the rooftop, I don't care who listens or who doesn't listen, and yet can prove it. Simple questions, they begin to, you know, wobble and fumble or go into aggression mode, passive aggression. But you have something you can hold on to, you can truly believe. They want to shut you down. They want to censor you. They want to keep you quiet. No, child of God, don't let that be. Stand bold and defend the faith. Hallelujah. All right. So the author's intent is to produce an orderly, systematic, and methodical argument for the facts and principles surrounding Christ, the person, his life, his works, his message, his influence on his followers, and as such, their influence on the known world. Powerful. All right, so with that, we come to caveat lector. <laughs> so readers, beware. What am I trying to accomplish by this? As you read the book of Acts, beware of these things. Don't just read the book of Acts like, you know, a storybook, a history book that is only relevant to history for the past, has no relevance to today. No, when you read, read with understanding. When you read, connect the dots. When you read, ask the right questions. When you read, look for the right information because the background knowledge helps you do that better. Caveat lector. So the author of the book of Acts aims to show that Jesus is whom he said he was. <clears throat> so when you read the book of Acts, you'll be looking for, and that's why we had to do what we did last on Wednesday, going back to the prophecy of Jesus, because you're going to see that those were being unfolded in the book of Acts. So the author is showing us Jesus is truly who he said he was. He kept his words of promise to his followers. And for those who are not there you know, for the first lesson, please go back to any of our page, either our YouTube page or our Facebook page, and you know, look for uh, the, the message from Wednesday. Well, actually, we're going to be posting it on, uh, tomorrow. So it's going to be on Facebook tomorrow. All right. So the author also shows that Jesus is alive and continues to work in his believers through the promised Holy Spirit. So first and foremost, he pulls from the past Jesus is who he said he is or was. Not only is he alive, but he kept his word of promise. And so if he, if he kept his word of promise and he's alive and he's still working through his Holy Spirit, then those who believe on him can know that every word of promise is given to them, he will also keep because he's one who keeps his word. Like our popular song, he's a man of his word. Hallelujah. All right, so modern believers may find in the book of Acts an orderly written, well-executed argument and systematic documentation of the facts and principles of the Christian faith. And I say this because I don't think, you know, as believers, we've approached the book of Acts from that perspective. So the next time you are reading the book of Acts, please understand you are actually reading a treatise. You are reading a defense for the Christian faith. You are reading an orderly, executed, systematic, <laughs> executed uh, 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 documentation of facts and principles of your faith. So the book is a strong and credible defense for our faith in Jesus Christ. We're going to find. And also with the Holy Spirit in us, we can also influence our world like the first generation believers did. Somebody say amen to that. Because the Holy Spirit is alive and active in us. All right, so we come to the last subheading, and we're going to dwell a little bit on this, a powerful treatise for the Christian faith. So we shall now go through a number of very important facts the writer established in this treatise. First is the importance of the words of Jesus. The second is the veracity of the death of Jesus. A lot of people keep saying, hey, it is believed that he died. His disciples said he died. However, they could not prove it. You hear people make statements like that. Or oh, maybe he was in a coma, an induced coma. People say all kinds of things. Well, the writer here doesn't agree with you. He wants to let you know Jesus really died. And then he's also going to show us the veracity of the resurrection of Jesus. So we're not talking about an apparition. 
We're not talking about a ghost, a floating something in thin air. No, a resurrected being. There's a difference. There's a difference. We're not talking about a ghost. Always oh, a ghost. Don't forget when he came walking on the water, they said, oh, ghost, ghost. They said, no, say, it's not my ghost. It's me. <laughs> it's me. And when he rose, we can see, can't no ghost grill fish. We don't, we, I don't know no ghost who grills fish. But Jesus grilled fish for them. As a matter of fact, one time he said, do you have anything to eat? They said, yes. Yeah. said, give it to me. <laughs> they gave him bread. They gave him what he ate right in their presence. Ghosts don't eat. So Jesus is a resurrected, the resurrected Jesus is a resurrected being complete. Not a ghost, not an apparition. The writer proves that. And so you, you can defend the faith based on this thing. So our belief system is not on fables. It's not on hearsay. It's not on what somebody said. It is on evidence, infallible proofs. The author also established the veracity of the ascension of Jesus. People say, no, he ascended. But I believe it or not, it's not the issue. But we have proof for it. And then the author established the veracity of the prophecy or promise of Jesus, how that his words were true. All right, so first, let's look at his opening statement. We're going to go back to the opening statement in the first treatise of the book of Luke. So in Luke chapter 1, from verse 1 to 4, it says, In as much, you got to pay attention to this, in as much as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Any legal expert or an, a subject matter expert who reads this, I mean, they can make a lot of deductions out of this. Powerful. It's just that we weren't taught to do that. We were just taught to believe and you know, manifest power and all that. But knowledge is power, hallelujah. Knowledge is key. So we can see some of the texts we're going to, I mean, some of the phrases we're going to try to talk on. The first one, he said, many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative. Please listen to this. So we now know from the author's own words that some other people wrote from their perspectives. The author is, I mean, this is so, this is so wonderful. The author says, I acknowledge other people are writing, okay? But from my understanding and my perspective, they are writing a narrative. That's right. I'm glad you got that. They are writing a narrative. Now, think about it. If what they wrote was good enough, was there any need for him to write anymore? No. What he would do is point us to X, Y, Z. And so X, Y, Z wrote and their works are good. Let's stay with that. No. So he said they were writing from what their own narratives. So in other words, from their own perspective. So we know that when he considered what they wrote, at least he felt that's not good enough. So we can also deduce from that, that what this man wrote, he took himself out of it. And as a matter of fact, when you read, you're going to see, he removes himself from the whole thing because all he wants you to know is the facts and the principles. He just wants you to know what happened. I'm not trying to present myself. I'm not trying to make myself something that I'm not, or even if I am. I, I just want to focus on the truth, the facts, the principles, which also tells me he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. How do you know that? Jesus said he will not speak of his own self. He will take from me and will reveal to you he will glorify me. So when I see an author who is not writing to project his own self, I can tell you are inspired by the Spirit of God. Because as an author, if you're writing from your flesh, you want to project yourself. 
You want to talk about how good you are. You want to tell us your pedigree, what you've accomplished. And you want to tell us how good you are. By the way, that is one thing that makes the Bible different from all the books of religions. The Bible gives it to you as a, exactly as it is. The good, the bad, the ugly. You see it all. You see it all. And that is why a lot of people find it difficult to accept Jesus Christ as Messiah because they're like, huh? How can he be Messiah and be subjected to such humiliation? How can he be Messiah and mere humans treat him like a common criminal? How can he be Messiah and he died on the cross at the death of a criminal? What kind of Messiah is that? Well, you're dealing with the one who is the truth. The truth does not hide nothing. The truth is just what it is. The truth. Now, whether you accept it or not, that's up to you. But you're going to see that the truth prevails by that same virtue, just being the truth. <laughs> you know, when you talk about God being holy, what, what does that mean? I'm, no, I'm, I'm digressing and I shouldn't be doing this because it takes my time. But when you're talking about God being holy, you know, I understand that is abstinence from sin, evil, and all that. Yeah, that's true. But if that's all you know about holy, then you miss the main, say, the main importance or the import of the statement. When you say God is holy, what you're saying is he is complete in himself. So he does not need anything else that will make him tilt to the left or tilt to the right or want to accept what you, you see what I'm saying? And it's from that perspective that you do not fall into any temptation because you are complete in yourself. As a Paul said, we must be do what we must be what complete in him also. When we are complete in him, then there is no pressure to lean to the left or to lean to the right, to listen to this or to listen to that. No, Yahweh, the Lord God, is my sufficiency. Like Abraham said, so I've lifted my hands to Elohim, Elion, most high God. So don't come and bribe me with your gold and silver. It won't work. So this man is telling us many had written, but from their own narrative. Then look at the next phrase. He said, those things which have been fulfilled among us. So the writer asserts that this event happened in his lifetime. Because if they were fulfilled among us, then that means he was there when they were being fulfilled. He was there, at least some of them. Not all, we're going to see not all, but he was there when some of them were being fulfilled. And think about that. So some things were being fulfilled in their time, which were prophecies from the old. Oh, that's powerful. So child of God, can we observe things that are being fulfilled in our time based on the word of God? That is a question we must answer. And so he goes on in the next phrase to tell us that it is just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. So we can now tell he was not there from the beginning. Are you seeing that? We know some things were fulfilled in his presence among us. So he was there. But we know he was not from the very beginning because he's referring to those who were there from the very beginning. So that's not him which is how we know he's a second generation disciple because the first generation disciples were there from the very beginning. But certainly he was in contact with first generation disciples because these things were what delivered to them, delivered to us, he said. But something else you see here is the fact that those who were from eyewitnesses were also ministers of the word and that separates them from the crowd. Because there were crowds who were there from the beginning, but they were not participators. They were celebrators and they were observers from afar. So this man is talking about those who were in the inner circle because they were also ministers of the word. They too were ministers of the word. So you could say those were the apostles of Jesus Christ because they were the ministers of the word at the time. All right. So he was a protege to first generation eyewitnesses and ministers. The next phrase said, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account. So right, just looking at that, I can say that 
I mean, okay, let me just read first. He felt compelled. That's right. All these others were writing a narrative, but he said, it seemed good to me, which means something is still missing. I got to do something about this. I have to fill in the gaps. I have to set some, and the next line actually helps, an orderly account. So he probably read what these other folks were writing, and he didn't think those were orderly enough. <laughs> what does that tell you? So we're dealing with a scholar who is orderly, both in his thinking and in his presentation. Some people say he was a doctor, at least maybe not a medical, but a doctor you know, of some uh, degree. So we're talking about a student, or an educated, a well-read, a professional, an expert who understands what it means to set an orderly account. Not everybody could do that. Not everybody could do that. As a matter of fact, for you to read other people's materials and consider it not good enough means you have some high level <laughs> understanding and techniques in writing. All right, so we knew that. So he, he's not just writing a narrative, but an orderly account. So again, like I said, he removed himself from the whole picture because he wants to set the order or set the, the account straight. And then look at what he said. He said he had perfect understanding. So we're not dealing with a novice here. We're talking about somebody who understood exactly what he was talking about. Oh, and then 2,000 years later, you have you know, people trying to make unnecessary arguments and debates that they don't know. How do you do that? And because we as believers have not been taught to be defenders of the faith. But now I hope at the end of this, we are able to defend the faith. It's part of our expected outcome. And then he talks about Theophilus, most excellent Theophilus. So he was writing to his own protege just as it was handed to him. But the word, the, the phrase most excellent tells me also what he thought about Theophilus. So he may have had all that protege, but Theophilus stood out. He considered Theophilus what? Excellent. He considered Theophilus one who was, you know, uh, 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 desirous of knowledge. And, and why am I going into that? Because a lot of times folks today don't care about knowledge. We don't care about historical facts. For us, truth doesn't matter. We just want our feelings taken care of. But you can go far with God that way, child of God. God is not a God of your feelings. Jesus said, I am what? The way, what? The truth. So if you as a child of God, you're not a person of the truth, you're going to have problems with Jesus. Not that you have a fight. He may just leave you to your own device. And then you think everything is okay, but it's not. God is a God of truth. Truth matters to God. Uh, Psalm 89, 14, his throne is established or founded upon what? Righteousness, justice, mercy, and what? Truth. Those are the foundation of his throne. So when we approach, we say, oh, Lord, we're coming to the throne of God. Well, guess where you're coming? Righteousness, justice, mercy, and truth. I didn't see feelings there. It's not a God of feelings. And actually, that should elevate our prayer life because a lot of people approach God from the perspective of your feelings. Yes, he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities, no doubt, but don't stay there for too long. Become a son who understands your right, your privilege, your responsibility in God. Because although God may uh, be touched with the feelings of your infirmity, guess what? Satan is not. Satan ain't going to be touched with your infirmities or the feelings of your infirmity. In fact, when you show him any slight weakness, aha, you've just opened the door for him. You just open the door for the enemy. So you must be a child of God who understands your rights, your privilege in the word of God. Stand upon the integrity of his word and the power of his spirit. You're going to get better results doing that. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. All right. So the next phrase it talks about is that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. This guy is not playing games here. He wanted his protege, Theophilus, to have certainty of the things that are being handed over to him. 
of the things that he's been instructed. As ministers, I think we, a, a measure of that should also come from us. When we teach, when we preach, let's have some certainty to what we're saying. And so that those who are hearing us, who come to hear us, will have a certainty of what they are receiving. So we can tell that this is the work of a scholarly and protective author. Oh yeah, he's protective. I mean, we can tell because if he wasn't satisfied with all the writings, said, no, you guys aren't doing a good job here. I'm going to write something that I believe is an orderly account. He's protective, protective of the truth, a defender of truth he is, who himself is immersed in the work and the events. All right, so I'm not going to read this. We already read it. Let's just move on quickly. So... Uh, we already said it's, he made a treatise, he's writing to the simple. I think I, I, I probably copied something else. Okay, so now we said we're looking at some of the things that he highlighted. Uh, we already talked about this. He's writing to the same person, Theophilus, uh, since that was his former treatise, this is his present treatise. But he now begins to let us know the words of Jesus are equally important. <clears throat> he said, what I'm writing to you, which I've defined as a treatise, is about all that Jesus began both to do and teach. So we know the treatise is about the life of Jesus, but not just his deeds, but his teachings as well. Is that important? Yes, because a lot of times people focus only on the deeds of Jesus. Man of Galilee, miracle worker, walked on the water, healed the sick, raised the dead, fed the 5,000. We, we, we celebrate the works of Jesus. We celebrate the acts. We celebrate the miraculous part of Jesus. But what did Jesus himself say? If you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say. What did he say? You're not my disciple yet. So this man is showing us that the words of Jesus are equally important. Just as we celebrate the works of Jesus, the deeds of Jesus, the miraculous part of Jesus, we must equally celebrate the words of Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus exalted his word above his actions. In fact, in many cases, like when he cursed the tree and the tree withered by the next day, and they said, oh, master, the tree withered. So why are you surprised? Why does that amaze you? So even Jesus didn't consider the, the miraculous work as important as his words. His words were more important. And so he would say, verily, verily, assuredly I say to you, and as God's people, as students of the word, as ministers, we ought to pay attention to the words of Jesus, not just his deeds. Celebrate his deeds because they are definitely manifestations of the power of God, but also celebrate his words. So the teachings of Jesus are equally important. This man or the author, the writer, wanted his protege to take note of that. That this is not only about what Jesus did, but it's also about what he taught. So pay attention to both his deeds and his teachings as well. And then he goes up to tell us that it's about the deeds and teachings of Jesus until the day in which he was taken up. Okay, so. From that statement, we know the author knows Jesus was actually taken up, all right? But secondly, Jesus continues to do and teach until he was taken up. He never stopped at any point, which says to us, you never stop at any point until you are taken up yourself. Now, of course, our taking up doesn't have to be an ascension, right? <laughs> it could be, you know, Falling to sleep, like the Bible calls it. Or it could be the Lord calling you home, however he chooses to. But the point is, we never retire. We never get weary. We never give up. Now, people say they retire, but, you know, I think what they mean is retire from an aspect of ministry and probably devote to another aspect of ministry. If that is it, then that's fine. But if you retire totally from ministry, what else are you going to do? Jesus asked Simon, uh, no, Simon actually asked Jesus, to whom else shall we go? For thou hast the words of eternal life. So where else are we going? If we stop doing this, what else are we going to do? 
It's okay to take vacations, but you never retire or stop doing and teaching because the Holy Spirit in you is in you for how long? Forever. So even Jesus continued to do and teach until he was taken up. He never stopped. The writer also establishes that Jesus was actually taken up. Either he was there when it was happening, or again, he received the information from eyewitnesses. Either way, it is credible. The next phrase, it says, after that he, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. So we know that before the ascension of Jesus, he actually gave commandments to his chosen apostles. But we also know the commandments were given through the Holy Spirit. So don't assume that this is just Jesus speaking. This is also Jesus speaking through the Holy Spirit. What does that make the Holy Spirit? A commander also. And why is that important to us? Because oftentimes a lot of us look at the Holy Spirit as our messenger. We tell him what to do. We tell him where to go. We tell him how to do it. Do it now. Come back here, Holy Spirit. Sit down, Holy Spirit. Stand up. Okay, child of God, please learn. In the days of ignorance, God winked at. But when you begin to understand truth, then you turn away from childish things, like Paul said. When we were children, we thought as children, we spoke as children, we acted as children. But when truth comes, when knowledge comes, when revelation comes, when insight comes, what do we do? We put away childish things. The Holy Spirit is in charge here. The Holy Spirit is commander here. The Holy Spirit is overseer of this project. We are recruits. We are the ones who serve the purpose of God. The Holy Spirit does not come to serve our purpose. He's, Jesus said it. He's not here to do his own bidding. Now, if he's not doing his own bidding, why will he do your bidding? <laughs> he's not doing his own bidding. So why will he do your bidding? He's here to do the works of Jesus. He's here to testify of Jesus. He's here to glorify Jesus. And just in case you didn't know, Jesus is king. So you see, that begins to elevate Jesus to the, where he truly belongs. Which is that, and that is the vision or the, the call of Kingdom Ministers United. We are emphasizing Jesus Christ as the king of the kingdom. Not your houseboy, not your power. High five, Jesus. No. He's king. And what do you do to a king? You worship, you bow. His words are commands. His words are orders given, orders from headquarters. And all God's people who understand this line up and align themselves to the truth. Leave children to keep doing what children do. So the Holy Spirit is a commander. It's not our houseboy. It's not our messenger that we send on errands. All right, the next phrase, it says, to whom also, who is the whom? His apostles, his chosen apostles, his disciples. To whom he, who is he? Jesus, showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. Powerful. So the author, the writer is letting us know that Jesus showed himself alive by many, not some, not few, but what? Many undeniable proofs. So if somebody was saying, uh, is there proof that Jesus rose? Well, the problem is that you are 2,000 years late anyway. <laughs> so your argument is 2,000 years late because as at the time this was happening, this author is saying there were what? Undeniable, many undeniable proofs. Just because you were not there during the Second World War, does that mean Second World War never happened? Because just because you were not there when you know, Noah did his thing, does that mean the story of Noah never happened? Humans are arrogant, proudful, and yet we know nothing. One small, minute, infinitesimal, invisible virus, look at how it messed us all up, brought out the worst in us, shut us down, and yet you're thumping your chest like King Kong, like you're something. It says Jesus showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. 
So Jesus showed himself by many undeniable proofs. The writer also uses a phrase that may not be common today, but then it was. At the time of writing, it was. It is the phrase, his passion. To help us better, those of us who have seen the movie, you know, the passion of the Christ. All right, so when, when, when uh, Mel Gibson, you know, produced the passion of the Christ, he wasn't talking about how passionate Jesus was, okay? <laughs> he wasn't talking about how Jesus is a performer, a powerful actor with passion. No, what was he talking about? The magnitude, the type of the experience that he went through. That's what the author is saying here. So the author is saying that by his passion, in other words, the choice or chosen treatment that was given to him, the depth of it, the magnitude of it, the expected outcome of it, makes his resurrection a miracle. Because if you understand what he went through, <laughs> you might have, when we talked it here, I explained it, but I, I didn't go into details in, the, in, the, in this course. But we talked about it. You know, in the days of the Roman soldiers, they had different kinds of death. You had death by hanging, right? You had death by piercing of the sword. How was uh, James killed? James died by the sword. No, James died by the sword, we were told. Uh, you know, then you had death by, you know, uh, uh, beheading. In fact, death by beheading is uh, an honorable one. Ro uh, Paul was a Roman citizen, and it is believed that he was beheaded. Because he's a Roman citizen. So they respected his citizen status. So he was beheaded. But then you now have death by crucifixion. Okay, so what is death by crucifixion? Death by crucifixion is reserved for the worst set of human beings. Not just worst set as in society, but worst to the government. When you are a threat to the government, when you become a pain in their skin or a thorn in their flesh, then they want to give you death by crucifixion. Then you also have death by discardment, <laughs> like John thrown to the island of Patmos, like, you know, die there. So the Roman soldiers had different kinds of death. Oh, there are many others. There is death by horse pulling you. All these things the Roman soldiers did. So you'd be tied to four horses and then each horse is going in its own direction until they rip the person apart. Yeah. Yeah. They had all those debts. They had all those debts. <clears throat> they had all those debts. So, so, so Jesus was given death by crucifixion. So the writer is saying, if you understand what that means, his passion, his experience, the depth of what he went through, it is intended to certify that you are truly truly dead i'm not going to go into details but we talked about this to the point where the roman soldiers came to break his legs they found that he was already dead but the guy said okay maybe he's playing games maybe he's not really dead so what did they do use the spear right and pierced his side and when they pierced his side what happened the bible said blood and water gushed out that tells us something that blood was separated from water or water was separated from blood. And since blood is thicker, blood settled down and water stayed on top. So if you pierce the sack and blood came out first, not that they are mixed, as a matter of fact, biologists will tell you, if the blood and water are separated in the vein, okay, it's dead. <laughs> it is dead. So what is the writer showing us here? Jesus truly died. So for anybody who says they are educated person to be asking the question today, you see, you're making yourself ignorant by saying that. Because the first thing you want to do is go and study his passion. Go and study death by crucifixion. Death by crucifixion is, it ensures that the individual truly dies. As a matter of fact, to show you how bad it is, or it was, when time was going, don't forget the sun became dark and all of that, right? So they wanted to get out of the place quickly. Normally, they would have just sat back and waited until they truly died. But the sun, things began to happen in the sky. They're like, okay, guys, we can't stay here. Let's get out. And somebody said, oh, but they're not dead yet. The thieves were not. So, but they're not dead. It's okay. Well, we got to do something to kill them. Break their legs. You see that? Oh, people miss all of these things. Break their legs. 
What are you doing by breaking legs? You're causing excruciating pain on top of the crucifixion that is already going on. Because you must understand, oh man, I tell you, I'm not going to explain it. This, this just messes up your day. Go and study it yourself. Dead by crucifixion is terrible. It is terrible. The weight of your being is hanging on your lungs. You're gasping for breath because your lungs can't hold on for too long. Look at what a virus is doing to our lungs. <laughs> it chokes you up. And then you're trying to hang on the support of your legs, which are also pierced, by the way. So there's pain there, but you got to support. And then somebody breaks it. <laughs> and then somebody breaks your support. So your whole being collapses on your lungs. Your lungs are ripped apart by his passion. But guess what? He showed himself what? Alive. Which is a miracle. Because you couldn't have gone through that and still be alive. That's what the man was saying. If you get that. All right. So next phrase, it says, being seen of them for what? 40 days. Oh, I love this one. Jesus was not in a hurry to go. <laughs> he wasn't like, let's get out of here before they find us. No. 40 days. Alive, resurrected, but stayed back for how long? 40 days. So in other words, Satan, do whatever you can. I'm here. Roman soldiers, I'm here. I'm not in a hurry to go away because I got work to finish. Said he was alive for 40 days. Wow. I wonder what those days were like. And then he was showing himself to his disciples. For those 40 days. So Jesus continued to show himself in many undeniable ways for a period of about 40 days. So no one could deny it. No one could deny it. As a matter of fact, when you now read Paul's writings, Paul tells us that, you know, in 1 Corinthians 15, 16, that over 500 saw him in his resurrected form. So when somebody say, give us an evidence of Christ's resurrection. Okay, how about 500? Can you take 500? <laughs> Paul says over 500 saw him. And in fact, he said, many of them were still alive at the time he was writing this. Yeah. So modern believers may find in the book of Acts an orderly written, well-executed argument and systematic documentation of the facts and principles of the Christian faith. And these are the foundations of the Christian faith. The birth of Jesus, his virgin birth. The fact that he's the son of God. He came from heaven. It's not, wasn't formed of man. That's what you mean by a virgin birth. His message, his words, his teachings, his very life, his miracles, his crucifixion, which is in confirmation of biblical prophecy, which led to his death, of course. Then his resurrection. Then his ascension. And then the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in accordance with his promise. Right? There's your, your faith, your uh, foundations of your faith. And this man is proving them all in a very systematic and methodic way. And with that, we come to the end of the session today. Hallelujah. Let's stand to our feet. Give God praise. Let's stand to our feet. Give God praise. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. Lord, we give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. We give you adoration. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Come on, worship him. Give him praise. Give him honor. Give him glory. Give him praise. Give him honor. Give him glory. Give him praise. Give him honor. Give him glory. Give him praise. Give him honor. Give him glory. Oh, Father, we give you praise. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge you. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for you are the one teaching us. You are the teacher. We have no ability in our own self to, to, to teach with such clarity. It comes from you, Holy Spirit, and we, we acknowledge you. We acknowledge you. We acknowledge, We give you the credit. It belongs to you. Continue to teach us. Continue to open our eyes. Continue to give us clarity. Continue to unveil scriptures to us. And Lord, we pray that even every word that has gone forth today, was for the strengthen the faith of your people, strengthen the faith of your believers, wherever they are. For we know these are trying times all over the world. But may your people be strengthened, oh God. May your people be empowered by the Spirit. May your people be encouraged, oh God, to be defenders of the truth, defenders of the faith, even in the face of falsehood and deception and lies of the enemy. 
And Lord, we declare that you are in charge. The devil is not in charge. We declare you are in charge. Humans are not in charge. We declare you are in charge. The world is not a free fall. You are in charge, oh God. And our lives belong to you. We belong to you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. And for our viewers, we'll come your way again sometime soon. Till then, God bless you. Bye-bye now.